Sir, let it alone for one more year. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. What sort of patience is it that is the patience of God? I think we can go ahead and cross out the most common sort of patience that I believe we all exert whenever our goals or our actions are being frustrated and flustered in some way. This first sort of patience that I want to talk about being a patience that ta that's tantamount to restraint, okay? You're holding yourself back. Let's make this real. I want you, my friends, to go with me to one of my not-so-great moments. Go with me to a Wednesday morning, really any Wednesday morning during the school year. Y'all know I teach the God, Grace, and Gumption Theology class at 10 o'clock here at St. Mark's on Wednesday mornings, and sometimes I'm on the rota to celebrate the 9.30 Eucharist and Healing Liturgy, which, by the way, if you haven't ever been, I would commend it to you. It's a beautiful time. I love to go, but I hate showing up in Fairfield County from New Haven at 930 in the morning because, as you all know, I'm sure, that is in the thick of rush hour. There's nothing quite like Connecticut traffic to teach you about trials and spiritual disciplines. So go with me to a Wednesday morning. I have done everything right this time around, and I admit I do not always do everything right on Wednesday mornings. I have brushed my teeth, I've washed my face, I've got a clean suit. I've done everything that my mother always told me to do if I was going to be in public, and I even left early this Wednesday. I left early. I have plenty of time. But for one reason or another, they decided that this was the day they wanted to mow the median. Y'all know what I'm talking about. With no rhyme or reason, the grass is fine. Today is the day they're going to mow the median. Or what really gets me is, now I love Connecticuters. I really do. I love you people. I never want to leave. But here's the deal. Y'all slow down to look at wildlife like you've never seen a squirrel before. <laughs> so there's a squirrel over in the median and we pull up to the Darien exit. Y'all know the one, the Darien exit on the Merit. And we're crawling, right? 10 miles an hour, stop. 10 miles an hour, stop. 4 miles an hour, stop. I have a Prius, so this is good. At least I'm not wasting gas, but I'm wasting my time. And then I finally get past the Darien exit, and I see what all the fuss was about. Not actually that many people. There's a squirrel, or a deer, or a turkey. Insert wild animal that Connecticuters think is so exotic. Just insert it there. There's this animal on the side of the road, and everybody's just, oh my goodness, I gotta look. But then I tell myself, Justin, be patient. Patience there at 9.05 at the Darien exit as my, as my ETA keeps going up and up and up and it creeps closer and closer and closer to 9.30 and I think to myself, oh my gosh, Sarah Smith and Amanda Sutton are going to have my hide if I don't show up in 10 minutes. Patience there is restraint. I'm holding back my fury. I'm resisting honking the horn for 10 minutes. I'm resisting flipping people off. I'm resisting getting out of my car, going to the car in front of me, knocking on the window and saying, dude, it's a squirrel. <laughs> this is especially important whenever I'm on my way to church because I'm wearing my clerical collar. <laughs> Justin, be patient. Be patient, restrain yourself. That's patience number one. There's a different sort of patience though. So go with me to another moment. This time, middle school, Justin. Oh, this should be fun. Okay, let's imagine I'm in eighth grade. My sister, Olivia, is in sixth grade and my parents have had the bright idea that I'm gonna teach her how to do her pre-algebra homework, which is not very good because I'm not very good at math. That's why I became a theologian. So I teach my sister how to solve for X. Sorry, I'm just remembering that one time that I did this. Um, I teach my sister how to solve for X, and she tries to do the problem herself, 
and I wait, and you know, she, she, she writes a little bit, and then she's like, mm -mm, no, 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 that's not going to work. And then she writes a little bit more, and then she's like, no, 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 no that's not going to work. And I finally, you know, it seems as if it's been an hour, right, since she started this, uh, started this math problem. Really, it's only been about 30 seconds. So I jump in, and I'm like, Olivia, the answer is four. Let me show you. I scoot her over, and I go, done. Now, that's pretty terrible teaching, right? Some aptitude for teaching I've got. That was how I tried to teach my sister how to do math. My parents, though, reminded me, Justin, you didn't learn how to solve for x in 30 seconds. Give Olivia some time. Be patient. Patience in that case is the patience of withdrawal. I needed to leave my sister well enough alone. So that's what I do. I give her time. I scoot over, I tap my foot, I close my eyes, I try my darndest to keep my impatience under control. I'm restraining myself, but I'm also withdrawing. I'm leaving Olivia alone long enough for her to solve for X and actually learn how to do it. That's patience number two. There's a third sort of patience, though, a sort of patience that Jesus is talking about in our gospel lesson this morning. And that, I think, is the patience of the gardener. The gardener in today's lesson says a remarkable thing. Sir, let it alone for just one more year. Let me paint the picture for you. The vineyard owner owns a bunch of land. What are fig trees for? They're for growing figs. He's paid for the tree. He's planted the tree. He's got all this land. He's hired this dude, this gardener, right, to take care of the fig tree. And he goes up to the gardener and says, I'm not making very good on my investment. This fig tree is not making any figs. I'm tired of that. I love this line. I can't believe he actually, Jesus actually said this, but it's rather clever. Why should it be wasting the soil? <laughs> That's remarkable. This tree is not only a waste of my time, it's a waste of the ground it's in. This man is impatient. The gardener, though, intervenes. He commends a patience to the vineyard owner that is not simply restraint, like me on the merit, is not simply withdrawal, like me trying to teach my sister pre-algebra. It's instead a patience of presence. The presence of the gardener as he labors to prepare the ground around the roots. The presence of the fertilizer, which the gardener thinks might just give this fig tree a fighting chance. The patience of presence, the patience of the gardener is the sort of patience that is closest to the patience of God. Karl Barth, the greatest Protestant theologian of the 20th century by most counts, gave a great deal of thought to this idea that God is patient. Barth said, you know, we can definitely imagine a God. We can imagine a God, even a God who is loving, but who all the same is not patient. Such a loving but impatient God would see the world in the sorry state that it's in, right? The fallen state that is so poignantly and powerfully summarized in two parts by Jesus at the beginning of our gospel this morning. A world rent asunder first by the human abuse of free will. Okay, this is represented by the slaughter of innocent people perpetrated by Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect of Judea, under whose authority Jesus himself would eventually be executed. And the second way that our world has fallen, that Jesus names, is in the tragic, seemingly meaningless, random miscarriages of our natural world which is represented by the Tower of Siloam falling of its own accord, 
killing 18 people who were trapped beneath it, Jesus says. You want a gospel text that is relevant to our everyday lives. Jesus has just named our everyday lives. We are rent asunder by the abuse of freedom like Pilate and natural disasters, seemingly random, like the Tower of Siloam falling on all of these people in Jesus' own day. A loving but impatient God, Bart says, would see this sorry business, see that it's sorry, and would do everything he needed to fix it, and fix it fast. Flip the magic switch, and wham! Redemption in a flash. Bart was afraid, though, that while this impatient redemption might be motivated by love, that it would have the effect of flattening us. Flattening our freedom, our free will, beneath the steamroller of God's will. And flattening the three-dimensionality of our risky, vulnerable, fragile lives. Pilate wouldn't kill anyone anymore with this impatient redemption. Towers wouldn't capsize in on themselves anymore But the question he asks is, would we, would our world, really be us if we no longer lived lives of freedom, lives of risk? Now what a cop-out, Justin. I would imagine you were probably thinking. What a cop-out, Justin. Way to dissolve a real world of real suffering or my real life of real suffering into the abstraction of a philosophical question. Stay with me for just a moment. See, this is exactly what Jesus is staring square in the face this morning. And if we're going to be followers of him, we have to stare it square in the face as well. The age-old question of why do bad things happen to good people? One of the knee-jerk reactions we human beings have psychologically to this question, one of the ways that I think, I don't think it's a nasty thing about us, I think it's one of the ways that we make ourselves feel safe. It's certainly the way that I make myself feel safer amidst the random and sometimes not so random terrors of life involves quibbling with the terms of that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? We say, well, no, actually, bad things must only happen to bad people. Tit for tat. Maybe they didn't seem so bad on the surface, but that must have just been because I wasn't able to see very clearly. Deep down, they must have deserved it. Or what's maybe even worse, Maybe we tell ourselves, deep down, I must have deserved it. Let me be very clear. That is exactly the kind of answer that Jesus is unequivocally disqualifying here. He could not be clearer. Were those Galileans slaughtered by that despot Pilate because they were sinful? Jesus asks, rhetorical question. He says, no. Were those 18 people killed in the collapse of the Tower of Siloam because they were bad people? No. Jesus is saying, don't miss it, karma is not a Christian doctrine. It is incompatible with Jesus. Bad things just happen. Period. And honestly, they can happen at any time, which is why Jesus calls us to repent. Repent, Jesus says, and make good and wise use of the time you have. Having so definitively ruled out this harmful but very tempting, I'm telling you, it is so tempting that I think every single day I am tempted to think this way, to make myself feel safer, or to at least explain why the things that happened to me and those I love happened. But having ruled out this harmful but tempting answer to the question of why bad things happen, Jesus does something rather unhelpful on the face of it, he refuses to give us an alternative answer, at least not a straight one. Instead, he tells this story about the fig tree and the gardener, pointing us, as he often does, sometimes annoyingly, to who God really is, rather than who we want God maybe to be. He says that God is really a God of patience, a God like the gardener. Let me return now to Bart, who writes this. 
we define God's patience as his will, deep-rooted in his essence, to allow to another space and time for the development of its own existence. Fulfilling his will towards this other in such a way that he does not suspend or destroy it, but accompanies and sustains it and allows it to develop in freedom. God allows human beings, God allows our world, space and time to develop and grow. This is his patience. So God is not impatient. Okay, we've got that. At least not the God of Jesus Christ. But neither is God patient only in restraint. Holding back his wrath, say, like I hold back my desire to get out of my car and go, you know, berate some poor Connecticut on the merit. Nor is he patient only in withdrawal, as if he abandoned the world in much the same way that I abandoned my sister as she worked on her equations. God is patient, rather, like the gardener, patient in and through his presence, accompanying and sustaining us and allowing us to develop in freedom as Bart says, in much the same way that the gardener tends to his fig tree. Comforting words, indeed, soft words. When we think of our personal failings, of our own sin, and if that's the word you need to hear this morning, then let this be it and ignore what else I have to say. Be patient with yourself, as your heavenly Father is patient with you. But there, too, is a harder and more difficult truth here into which Jesus himself has invited us. God is impatient, all right, he suggests. Patient with Pilate and with all manner of horrors, like the Tower of Siloam falling on 18 innocent people. Rather than eliminate suffering, Jesus suggests, rather than smooth out our human freedom, rather than straitjacket our complex natural world of causes, rather than write risk out of the world, the God of mercy, the God of patience, did not annihilate the causes of suffering, but opted instead to take suffering upon himself, into himself. God gave the universe space and time. But he also became radically present in this space and this time in Jesus. Present in the corpse on the cross. Present in the garden of Golgotha that fertilizes the universe with the seeds of Jesus' divinity. The seeds of resurrection. And see, that's the thing. Friends, I think that's the good news in this passage, that resurrection, like the fig tree, takes time. It takes time. Even Jesus' resurrection took time. You know, he didn't die on the cross and then, bam, he's back. It took time. Even Jesus was in the tomb a little while. It took a little while for him to be resurrected. Even now, I believe we, yes, you and me, are being caught up in resurrection. St. Paul says that if we are buried with Christ in a baptism like his, we have cause to hope in being united with him in a resurrection like his. And I think we are in the process of that resurrection. But here's the, here's the thing. As Father Peter suggested a few weeks ago when he was discussing the mir Jesus' miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana, this is resurrection in excruciatingly slow motion, so slow, sometimes, most of the time, we might not be able to see it. It is a patient resurrection whose goal is a pilot who freely consents to life rather than death. And boy howdy, is that going to take some time for someone like Pontius Pilate to say, yes, I want to choose love, not hate. A patient resurrection whose goal is a world, a universe, whose vulnerability and fragility mean simply that our lives and our loves are precious, as fragile things are, and no longer that they're precarious. The patience of God's presence then is to be answered by a patience of our own, 
the patience of hope. Hope in the engine of resurrection set aflame by Jesus. A resurrection into which we and the whole universe enter by being made one with him in the garden of his cross. Hope in the fact that just as Jesus was raised to life on the third day, so will we also. That what is true already of our Lord, true of his body, true of his spirit, true of his scars, will be true also of us and of those we love and of our world. This is a difficult thing Jesus is inviting us into in naming evil and then giving us the parable of the fig tree. I do not think it can be commanded. It can only be caught. The truth of Jesus' message here is lived out day to day in the lives of the saints. People who face immense tragedy, who suffer incredible evil, and yet maintain the patience of hope, imitating the patience of God. The good news for us at St. Mark's is that I know for a fact many such saints are seated right here. Listen to them. Listen to yourself, perhaps. Be patient with them. Be patient with God. He is patient with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.